How do you make a partner love you? The funny thing with this is, um, you can't make anyone love you. It's not that simple. Um, you can create an environment that makes you more approachable, more attractive, more interesting, whatever it is. Um, but nobody can be forced to love you. If somebody hates you um, just because they can't stand the sight of you, <laughs> then there's no way that's going to change anyway. But I've done a top 10 list of things that I think aren't just relevant to the Philippines. And I know we're often talking about westernization and uh, yeah, westernization and how it influences the, the the women and changes the way people see things. Um, but even a lot of these are still relevant because one of the biggest problems I find in the West is finances. The money takes control of too many things and these top 10 won't really discuss that because quite simply that is part of the poison chalice um, where these are the actual relationship side which are where the genuine interest should be. Um, so the first thing I would say is respect. A mutual respect for each other. It doesn't mean that one person is better than the other or um, there's like a competitive edge. You respect the person for who they are and what they do and the way they think. I've seen so many times in the Philippines um, where guys will talk down about their partners. This has no positive effect. <laughs> Um, you may think, oh, that woman's stupid. Whatever. Well, you married her. Um, the reality is, if you're not happy with your choice, then the person who made that mistake is you. I'm not surprised she's still there because obviously it's been financial, but you've certainly not given yourself a good relationship to be in, and neither is she. So respect is important, and it doesn't mean you have to be pushing, oh, you did the laundry really great today or looks like you had a long day at the hospital working as a nurse or whatever. It's just the fact of you saying like, I appreciate what you do or, you know, just making a little bit more effort because a lot of time people don't hear um, appreciation. So having some appreciation at the same as respecting what they get up to. It doesn't mean it's always right. Um, what I mean in that case is, for example, if they aren't a very uh, respectful person, for example, they don't respect you, they're always bad-mouthing you, you're in a bad relationship. And there's some ways to rectify it, and they'll, they'll actually still be in this top 10 list. Um, but the whole point here is that you've got to turn around and say, are you respecting your partner? I and mean, is she respecting you? If that isn't happening, fix it which gets on to communication um, which is number two communication is paramount to the survival of any relationship most of the failings I've seen have some breakdown in communication where there's been a lot of breakups based on assumptions or thinking this or but they haven't been talking to each other if they actually communicate to each other in the first place a lot of their problems wouldn't even exist. Um, so this is why communication is a, a solution to many things. If, for example, um, say your your partner says, my dad's sick and I want to send him some money, and you just go, no, it's not my problem. That's not communication. Communication is like, we haven't got any spare money this month. Where's your father's money? You know, it's discussing what the issues are, but also seeing the bigger picture. Is this going to have a negative effect with your wife? Is this going to affect your marriage? Is this something that is going to be an ongoing problem? If like, you turn around and say, but if I pay now, every time there's an emergency, they're going to be wanting more and more money. Or do you go the other route and say, hang on a minute, we'll send some money this time, but you need to make sure that nobody asks in the future. Um, it's how you communicate and discuss it. Everything's got to be discussed. If there's cultural issues and other things that relate to the Philippines, but even in different areas and stuff, people think different ways. People think 
people are naturally people. Uh, as such, not everything is always obvious, which is why communication, doesn't matter how simple some of this stuff is, it becomes a major problem over time because it festers, because it's never discussed. That's why I always recommend a lot of communication. In, and it doesn't hurt, you've got the time. Um, which gets on to point three with resolve instead of conflict. Like I was saying there with the family emergency, how do you resolve it? Is it going to be a case of they'll have to sort themselves out? Is this going to create a bigger problem with your wife than sending 50, $100 or whatever? Is it going to create a bigger problem by sending money? What you've got to sit down there and is sit there and try and resolve it. Look at it from different angles. If you say a blunt no, then you instantly become the bad guy. But if you turn around and say, okay, well, I can't say no, but I want to say no, how can I turn this around? So if you turn around and say, well, to your wife, well, what's the family emergency for? Why, why has your dad not got any savings? What um, has the, why is this our problem? You try and get your wife to actually see it from your point of view to, so that she becomes the person of responsibility because she's got to turn around instead of thinking just this is my parents and I don't care um, what you say, I want the money, which is often the effect that happens in the Philippines. But instead turns around and says, this is my husband's money, my husband made this money, um, this has got nothing to do with my parents, but at the same time I want to help my parents. So you start getting things on an even keel to see it from a bigger picture rather than I must send money, which is the craziest thing that is an ongoing problem with the Philippines. People just send it blindly. Um, and it just keeps, oh, they sent 6,000 this month for an emergency. I'm gonna ask for 6,000 next month. And I, that's what happens. And they go, oh, they're still sending it. I'm gonna ask for 10,000 this month. So you need to be able to sit there and look at how to resolve these issues um, so that you're working together instead of pulling apart. And this is where the family divides create bigger issues in your own family. Um, and that's why you need to work around this. Number four is understand your partner, which gets into some of this because it's not <laughs> manipulating things. It is a little bit. But the understanding what makes your partner tick. If her father is the be end and end all for her, then sending some money would be the easiest solution. But like I said, you still want to communicate, you still want to say this is this is a lot of money, this is X, Y, Z, I don't want this every month, I don't want this becoming people lying to us because they think of us as an easy target. But at the same time, you don't want your wife sitting there looking at you with dagger eyes. Um, so you need to understand your partner, but also what does she want in life? How are you going to make her happy generally um, and it doesn't mean giving her money to go gambling or shopping every day but actually creating a marriage that both benefits both parties it could be that your wife loves cooking so getting a lot of food access um, a lot of ingredients you may not have had access to before maybe putting her on a catering course maybe getting her to develop her own little cake business whatever it is is understanding your partner from multiple angles is what makes her happy and more independent and if she's more independent of relying on you it also means that she's happier generally this also helps with the scenario saying about the father thing because what happens is if she's more independent making her own money she then no longer needs to send your money but actually has access to her own funds which is often an alleviation from the headaches i know in the west a lot of guys when they bring their partners to the west because like the uk you generally need two people's incomes to survive in the uk um, if somebody's sending all their money home, and I know somebody who does this, and she actually works a lot of overtime, and her husband sat there going, I've got no life here. She's always at work, and she's paying for her brother to have a new car and all this rubbish. That it gets back to communication, and you need to get her understand your partner, and then turn around 
and put her back on the right track of the fact is she's getting abused by her family. Just because they didn't have it as a childhood, etc. doesn't mean her brother can sit on his backside living off, living off her. Um, she needs to understand that she married the guy and at the same time the family responsibilities are the family's responsibilities, not hers and not the husband's. It is there. If you decide to help, it's of a choice. It is not an obligation. Number five, give and take. This is a difficult one, but you've got to understand that when you arrive, you have the financial income. And this is from going to the Philippines, but generally guys earn more than women. It's a fact, you know, it's not a anti-feminist thing or whatever. It's a fact, and from the reality of things, it means that the obligation financially is often on the guy. Um, but you also need to understand that if your partner's from the Philippines, they're gonna have some issues with the family and other bits and pieces, which will encroach on your family life. So you have to be able to give and take. At the same time, if your wife decides she wants to take a college course, you should encourage it, not discourage it saying, well, I'm coming home from work and I don't want to be coming home to an empty house. You should be taking care of the house and the kids, not going to college. Find somewhere in the middle ground. There's online training courses. Is it really going to hurt that your wife goes to college three, three days a week? Is it going to affect the family life that much? Or is it actually going to give your wife some more independence, um, self-esteem and benefit her in the bigger picture. If so, a bit of give and take works both ways. In the same way, if you want to go out drinking with your buddies, but then complain that your wife wants to go and play bingo with her friends on a Friday, give and take. If you want to go out, she's got to be able to go out as well. If you both can agree on going out, you need to sit down and say, look, this isn't working. This isn't this isn't fair on both of us. How do we make this work? Do we both go to the um, poker night or whatever? And do we both go to bingo night? <laughs> you know, whatever it is. The whole point is, it goes back to communication, but you've got to be give and take, not just take, 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 because it just falls apart. In the Philippines, this is where I see guys crash and burn because their partners well, let the guy do what he wants to a point, but over six months or whatever, the woman's been calculating. She's been planning her next move, and she's just like got that little bit on her head that's just saying, once he just pushes it just that little bit too far, I'm going to come down on him. And that's what happens. At some point, it just goes bang, and then suddenly, guy loses his house, everything, blah, blah, blah. And it was self-inflicted um, because of some of the issues that were created prior to that happening um, which is why giving takes important communication is always the key element here be strong but not dominant this is quite a funny one because uh, obviously from a western perspective guys are supposed to use moisturizer these days and a bit of a bit of um, what do you call it you got a moisturizer and what's that stuff so I don't even know the names of these things. Um, you know, they have a bit of makeup here and there, a bit of a manicure, all this sort of stuff. Men are becoming women. <laughs> but in the Philippines, men are still men. Um, but I recommend being somewhere in the middle. They have plenty of guys that are um, womanizing, drinking, blah, blah, blah. Being dominant is more a case of being a good role model and husband if you want to go out drinking then think about it do you need to go out drinking is it would you be better having a few friends over on a friday night and getting their wives invited around um so that there is a mix of people rather than the guys just sitting in some bar somewhere you've got to look at things that you want to be Pushing your wife up, not pulling her down. Because she's used to being in a almost a caste system 
where in the Philippines, women are often pushed down as a, almost second citizen above the boys. You'll see it in the peer groups with schooling and stuff. It's always the girls, uh, the guys that are sort of lifted up. But also you see the girls are often dragged down and it's very difficult to get that balance. So if you've got a good wife and at the same time, you're respecting her and everything else and also helping picking her up and showing the world that she is somebody that is important you know important to you but also you're developing her as a person and helping her become a more independent person but also somebody that is more mature um wise to the world educated whatever it's lifting them up a lot because you've given them a lot more respect than many other people have. And this is why you can still be dominant, but you don't have to be um, excessive. You know, I'm not expecting you to put a penny on and do the cooking and be the house husband or whatever. But at the same time, there's nothing that says you, you can get your beer cans and just throw them out on the floor and expect your wife maid to pick everything up off after you. It's it's being a respectful person. Um, at the same time, your wife will still expect you to be the decision maker in the house uh, when it comes to things like uh, dealing with issues, etc. But that's why they like a dominant husband in Asia generally. Uh, but they don't want a... How would you describe it as? They don't want to be with somebody excessively dominant because it just it's just like becoming a, a maid or a servant. It's not neither people are happy. And that's that's where the balance is. I mean, in our life with me and my wife, um I make most of the decisions, but I involve my wife in all of them. Um because anything affects me, it affects her, it affects the children. So we sit there and discuss everything. Um, it's not a, although I get the final sort of say on things, I'd rather have my wife go, well, I don't really want to do that. And then going, okay, well, we'll look at something else then. Because with that sort of relationship, it works. Uh, what's next? Support. Yeah. Number seven, support your partner. A lot of women are used to being pushed down, um, so lifting somebody up has a major effect on them. If they want to get a better education, if they want to study something, if they want to achieve something, if they want to go somewhere, do something, encourage it and support it because that is the stuff that makes a relationship. That is the thing that says, when everyone else was saying I couldn't get my law degree or whatever, my husband pushed me to do it and he made sure that I had all the ac tools accessible to make it happen and I achieved it and your partner will remember that for the rest of their life it's a very very positive aspect doesn't matter what it is you know like my wife at the moment I've got her teaching English that has a positive effect long term first thing is she's more independent because she's teaching English. The second thing is she's engaging with a lot more people on a daily basis. So from a communication point from outside the house uh, is some extra people from around the globe. She's teaching people in, uh, I think, Barcelona, um, a pharmacist or something, English. There is, but it means that you're creating a world out of something that wasn't there before so they get this independence where they've got their own money they're developing their learning abilities and teaching abilities they're getting the the ability to think for themselves where before they may have been constantly um told what to do from a family environment where the plan of your life was laid out flat because what happens is the you're born, you leave school, the people that pay for your school want a payback at some point, they'll pay for you to go to college or whatever, then they want you to go to work so that you can then give your salary to pay for their retirement at an early age. 
that often happens in the Philippines. What you're doing now is actually creating a new environment and a new skill set and something they actually want to do. Because a lot of the time people do stuff they're told to do, which isn't the way of the world. It is the way the world works, <laughs> but it's not the way of the world people want to do. Um, for example, I do engineering. I'm qualified as an engineer. Um, what I end up doing is mainly auditing and things like that. Auditing is a very boring job. And people go, oh, I couldn't do your job because it's boring or whatever. Also very complicated for putting assessments on the cost of hospitals and things like that. But the point is, it gives me the life I want. This is why I can sit in Spain and be here with my family in the same way I could spend years in the Philippines in the same way I can achieve whatever I want to do. It's a means to an end. And this is the important bit. If you create a means to an end and then your partner has her ability to be more self-sufficient, but also maybe you as a couple want to travel to Singapore or something, it becomes much more achievable because as a family, you have more income, but also means to an end. You're creating a mindset that understands the eth ethics relating to work, but also the result of achieving and creating goals that I may have to work excessive hours this weekend, but next weekend I'm going fishing or whatever it is. You create and support your partner. And a lot of these things are not normal in Filipino uh, culture, so you have to introduce them. Point eight is very similar to the last one, is direct. And I'm not on about with a movie. Um, what I'm talking about is you direct your partner. When you talk to a lot of people, they don't know what they want to do in life. But what you need to do is change it from I don't know to what do you want to do with your life? Well, I want to travel, I want to do this, I want to do that. Okay, so how are we going to make that happen? What job do you want? I don't know what job I want to do. So you want, well, you do, you already got a starting point. You want a job that makes you travel and you want to travel and enjoy life. Yeah, but I don't know what job it is. Okay, so what type of travel? Well, I want to go here for months or whatever. So you're looking for something that you can do online. You're looking for something you can do remotely. You're looking for something that pays well enough to be able to travel. That gives you a starting point. But at the same time, you may have somebody else that goes, I love cooking. Okay, do you want your own restaurant? No, I hate. I couldn't deal with the stress of working in a restaurant. Um, do you want to make cake? Oh, I love to make cakes. Cakes is, cakes is good. So, why don't we look at getting you on a catering course on on how to make cakes and things like that, so you can do birthday cakes and stuff. You could do that from home. And no stress on it because you dictate how many cakes you do in that month or whatever. Small business ideas, but at the same time. You're directing somebody in something that before they may not even bother thinking about because there's a phrase I've come across quite a lot uh, and it's more to do with the fact that people do not think about the possibilities um, because they would rather not be disappointed. So what they do is they just don't raise their hopes or expectations. And I know you, it may sound a bit bizarre, but it's true. What you need to do is say, I want to achieve that. And the whole point is, even if you don't achieve it, at least you tried. And that's a completely different perspective. Because you're moving it from being defeatist to creating an expectation of success. And as such, the mindset of how to achieve it changes from, well, it ain't going to happen, to I'm going to make this happen. And this is why you need to direct people, change the way they think about things, but also it keeps them occupied, busy in doing something they want to do. And when they do achieve it, they're happy with themselves, but they're very, very happy that you supported and made it happen. Now, the next thing is love your partner, number nine. Loving your partner is the mo one of the, well, it is the fundamental thing. Because if you don't love your partner, you're wasting your time and you're wasting her time. 
Because sooner or later you're going to get bored and find somebody else because you haven't got that bond of attraction in that way. You may be beautiful, but you can flick through a magazine and see beautiful people. It doesn't mean that you love them. Love them is about having something deeper, um, a bond that's lifelong, a, a bond that combines you as a couple, um, which is why it's so important. So if you can't actually love somebody or can't love that person, then maybe this isn't a relationship for you. Otherwise, you need to sit there and look at the other points on this list and look at how you're going to change to make that happen. What is going to make you love that person? And I know there's a lot of people out there that are in loveless relationships, but the whole point here is you need to make it a relationship that has that love and attachment and bond because why else would you be together? You need to think about that one yourself because these other bits on the list will help. But you need to understand, if you don't have that love for your partner, you either have to decide that you're in the wrong relationship or you've got to decide you're going to work harder to make it work. Number 10 is probably the hardest one for a lot of guys. Change your vices or stop them. <laughs> um, so the thing for me is I do like to have a, a beer. I like to have a drink with uh, friends and socialize. Um, but at the same time, I've cut it down to virtually nothing. Um, because I know that I enjoy having a beer and stuff like that. But I forget things like time and things because I just get carried away. So I know where I need to cut things down. So I do. And my wife's happy with it. I'm healthier with it, but also you find in relationships, if you have several vices and issues, it can have some very detrimental effects on your relationship. Um, I'm originally from construction, and when I used to work in construction a long time ago, we used to drink every day. You know, like we'd be in the bar straight after work seven days a week. Uh, well, yeah, seven days a week because we work Saturday and Sunday as well. That was the environment I come from. I was a lot fitter then um, because we were building uh, timber frame houses for, I think we averaged about 12 to 16 hours a day. So when we finish work, we're tired. We just want to go have a beer, relax, let the body like chill out, then go home. Um, cause obviously you're pumped up with testosterone cause we're picking up the, uh, timbers all day long cause we build them on a huge bench. We'll build the timber frame walls. Um, we put the plywood on, we put the plasterboard on, we would put the windows in and then we'd pick them up by hand and stack them. So physically, um, everybody in there was extremely strong and physical, but at the same time, had the vice of everybody drinks. Um, so I know that I enjoy a drink because it become like drinking water because that was the environment I was in. So I like to have a drink on a, like say a Friday night, but even that has reduced considerably. Um, and I mean, it's not from, it's not from alcohol abuse. I think it's more of a point of it just become routine. Um, so it's very difficult to change that routine because it's already ingrained. But it's not, um, I'm, I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> I don't know people, well, that's the first thing people are alcoholics say. No, I'm not actually not an alcoholic. It's just, I, I drink when I feel like it um, and it's not every day. <laughs> it's probably like maybe once or twice a month. Um, cause even on a Friday, I may skip it for a few weeks be purely because I just can't be bothered. Um, but what I'm saying is before when I was reading construction, everybody drinks and I know that was one of those vices that has become so ingrained with me because that, that's been my, um, teens to my early thirties because that's what we did. That was life. Um, go, I mean, when I used to go clubbing and when I was 19, um, we would go out on Sunday, we'd go to like live bands on a Sunday 
Um, Monday was Passion and Pain Night at Images Nightclub. So we used to go for, that was like um, gothic and rock bands. So we used to go there on a Monday. On Tuesday, we used to just meet up and have a drink. Wednesdays was the over 25s at Tramps Nightclub. So we used to go drinking on a Wednesday. Thursday, Tramps is a normal night out. Um, Tramps, Tramps Nightclub. So we'd be in Tramps on a Thursday night. Friday night, um, we would go to Picasso's nightclub up in St. John's. Saturday night would be at Picasso's on a Saturday, um, on a Saturday night. So that was my week. Seven nights a week we were out. So it's, what I'm saying is we used to do a lot of drinking because we'd work, still go nightclubbing and stuff like that, be at work in the morning. And that was the routine. That was my, my teens um, partying most of the time. <laughs> I still got my education, by the way, because I still went to college and stuff. But it's looking back now. That's why my hair is... I look a lot tighter um, than I should do because of my younger years. Good times. Very, very good times. Don't regret any of it. But as you get older, you start to think, oh, I can't believe how much we used to drink back then and the things we used to do. Um, but they were fun times. But now I've got kids, I've got a wife, I've got a, it's like I'd rather just sit, drink a bottle of wine and watch a movie or just sit and watch the sun go down with a bottle of wine. It's not, it's not the same, is it? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. The whole thing changed. It's a different dynamic. You know, sitting there enjoying a bottle of wine, watching the sun go down is a bit different to... Getting from work, uh, going from work into the, a bar, drinking six, seven pints, then going home, having a shower, getting changed, and then meeting up with your friends at 10 o'clock, because then you get into the club before 11, and then you're there till 2, 3 in the morning, go to the kebab house on the way home, and then up for work for 6, 6 a.m. <laughs> that, was, that was my general routine on a regular basis for years. Um, yeah, those vices don't work in a marriage. <laughs> when I was single, there's no problem. When I was married, it's a different story. Um, that's what I say. You need to change or adapt. I've changed and adapted. Um, I'm much happier. My wife's much happier. And more importantly, I do more stuff for the kids. Today, we're going to meet up with another expat um, and his well, they're not actually expats. They're actually living in the UK. So he's not an expat anymore. But his wife is from the Philippines. So we're meeting up with them today. Um, but when you have kids and stuff, things change or should do. You should be more into what the kids are doing rather than yourself. Um, should do. <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching. That's my top 10, by the way. Um, I think these 10 things would enhance a relationship if you're not doing it it also put you in the right direction of having a more stronger relationship and the other thing is i would say it's worth having a think about these because you may find that you think my relationship is fantastic but i'm just going to try a little bit more and see if it makes any difference and then like just try a few things and see if anything actually works better with your partner you may find that your partner notices the changes and are, you know they're happy you know i'm not saying they're not happy already but small positive changes can make a, a lot of difference in a relationship without even noticing it yourself but your partner does all right thanks for watching